considered Matthew 6, starting at verse 19. And verses 19 down to verse 24 was addressed to the rich people. Verse 19 said, do not treasure up for yourself treasures on earth. And what it was talking about individuals that had the means by which they could take things that were of value and store them aside, if you please, for retirement or for an inheritance to their children. And so those comments, 19 through 24, to the rich people. Now, starting at verse 25 to the end of the chapter, which is our text this morning, we would say this is probably more inclined towards people who don't have the means, people that are considered poorer. So I'd like to read this familiar text from the lips of your Savior, Matthew 6, 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious then, saying, Oh, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In this passage that was just read, you will see the word anxious found six times. This is probably the preeminent portion in the New Testament dealing with anxiety. In fact, the word anxious is found 19 times in the New Testament. And so in this Sermon on the Mount, Christ addresses this topic. You know that there is a, another sermon that Christ preached found in Luke chapter 12. It's called the Sermon on the Plain. What is noticeable about the two sermons when you compare them is that the Sermon on the Plain, which was preached after this Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus Christ borrowed some of the same topics, some of the same wording that he gave on the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, he repeated his sermons that he preached. I wonder why he would do that. Well, you say different, different groups of people, uh, not necessarily that uh, they were both there at the same sermons. And that could be. There, there may have been a, a overlap of some individuals. But I tend to think it was for your sake and mind to read it in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and then to find some of those very same topics repeated in Luke chapter 12. The Lord knows that we need to be reminded of this. So our text begins here with a command. You will notice verse 25 says, do not. And the verb tense means continue to be anxious for your life. Or we might smooth it out a little bit and say, stop being anxious for your life. But then when it gets down to verse 31 that we read, 
It's the same verb, but a different verb form. And it would literally be rendered, do not become anxious then, saying. Verse 25, they are experiencing this type of anxiety. Verse 31, he's trying to prevent them in the future of experiencing anxiety. And then in verse 34, once again, he goes back to that original verb form. Do not become anxious for tomorrow, or literally stop being anxious for tomorrow. The word anxious <clears throat> literally means to be pulled, but it's like the idea of being pulled in two directions. Sometimes it has sort of the overview of don't be distracted. Have you ever found yourself in a conversation with someone? You're looking in the eyes, you're talking back and forth. It's a dialogue, but there's something over here going on. Maybe it's your child or grandchild. Maybe it's the cat or dog. And you catch that out of the peripheral vision of your eye. And as you're trying to hold the conversation, you find yourself looking over at this little commotion over here on the side. That's what he's talking about that you and I should be focused this way, but sometimes there are these distractions that pulls our attention this way. Now notice how verse 25 begins with the little phrase, for this reason, I say to you. So what reason is he talking about? Well, the words that just came out of his lips. Unfortunately, we looked at it two weeks ago and it's easy to forget it. What he said in the previous verse, verse 24, is that you cannot be controlled by two masters simultaneously. And then he mentions three things, what it means to have a master. It's you will love one of those, you will hold to one of those, and you will serve one of those. For this reason, because you cannot be a double-minded man, double-souled, two things simultaneously, because of that reason, I say to you, stop being anxious for your life. Now, this word anxious, we're going to see it on the front part of these, this notes, and it is the word that is in the bold print. The verses we've just looked at, verses 25, 31, and 34, it's translated anxious. But that same Greek word shows up in that account in Luke chapter 10 on your notes. There in the box. That Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And you know her preparations. It's Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus, who apparently live together. Two sisters and a brother cohabit in the same residence. But then there's Jesus, a very special guest, and his 12 apostles. So in other words, she's preparing a meal for at least 16 people. Now, that's like a Thanksgiving feast, you know? That's what we would consider when there's a big clan of people. There may have been others there too besides that. And she does not have electric stove or a gas stove. She's preparing this enormous sized meal over a wooden fire or maybe a cow dung fire. But anyhow, you have to keep your close attention on the fire to be sure that the heat is kept somewhat stable so that food doesn't become cold or doesn't burn. So she has this and the food preparations in cramped quarters, and she is distracted. But then the text goes on to say, but the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. I had a pastor, his name was Thomas Thomas, but this wasn't Martha's first name and last name, Martha, Martha. It's a double emphasis here to Grab her attention. You are worried. Now that's our word we're looking at. You are anxious. You are pulled. You are distracted. And not only being worried, but you are bothered about so many things churning around inside your head at this moment. Your hands and feet are going as fast as you can in preparation. But only a few things are necessary, really only one. 
what is the one thing that is necessary? Well, some look ahead to the following verse and say, well, the one thing necessary is that you join your sister here and sit at my feet and listen to the message. But if Martha did that, then there wouldn't be any hospitality shown because the food would be uncooked or undercooked and uh, everyone would be hungry when their stomach started to growl. Others think when Jesus said only one thing is necessary, he's talking about one dish, just one casserole. You don't have to have a six course meal. Her name is Martha, but she doesn't have to be a Martha Stewart. She doesn't have to make these fancy homemade decorations for the table plus a fancified meal. Just one thing is necessary. You know, I think if a lot of Christians took that to heart, they would be more inclined for hospitality. Ah, you invite somebody over to your house, you've got to do an entire house cleaning. I mean, what if they go upstairs and use the upstairs bathroom, right? Well, what if you only have one bathroom and they use that? I mean, uh, it's got to be spick and span and, and the floors have to be cleaned and vacuumed and it has to be total dusting of all every thing in the house has to be dusted and, and you could spend hours even before you get to the food preparation. People would probably be glad to see dust in your house and smudges on your floor because that's how their house looks right at that very moment. They're visiting your house, but you don't have to put on the Ritz. You don't have to do the big thing. You can call them up and say, listen, I'm having goulash for supper today. Any chance you'd like to come over and join me? And put out the paper plates. They don't care, really, they don't care. If they do, they're too fussy to be in this church. They won't last long. <clears throat> so here's Christ saying, stop being anxious. Don't become in the future anxious. I want to put a parenthesis right here as we look at our second point. This very word distracted, pulled, is used several places in the New Testament, and it is expected that we would be distracted. It's anticipation. In fact, it's a commendable thing in certain situations to be anxious. And let me tell you the two things, and then we'll look at the proof text. Number one is marriage. And the second one is ministry. <clears throat> marriage and ministry. Okay, let's look at the proof text. 1 Corinthians 7. One who is unmarried is concerned, there's our word, about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is, there's our word, anxious, stressed, pulled, is concerned about the things of the world. Oh, we're supposed to be unworldly. Don't be conformed to this world, the Bible says. When he uses the word world here, he's not talking about the outside culture and all its allurements and temptations. He's talking about the world in the sense how he may please his wife. So when you're married, you are expected as a Christian husband to be distracted about your wife, to be looking over and seeing how she's doing, be willing to drop your plans right here, whatever it is, to help her. Sometimes I think we get it wrong as Christian husbands. The Bible says that God made Eve as a helper, helper. You have a problem, a plumbing problem. So you call up a well-known plumber, one that you've used in the past, and he says, I'll be over in a couple of hours. And sure enough, within two and a half hours, he shows up with his assistant. Uh, judging by the looks of this assistant, he's probably 18, 19, maybe early 20s at the most. He's a young guy. He is the helper to the plumber. So what would you think if the plumber comes in, says, what's your problem? You say, I've got this terrible leak underneath my kitchen sink. He says, okay, he snaps his finger and the teenager pulls open the drawers, looks in, 
and the plumber sits down at your kitchen table and he pulls out the newspaper from his back pocket and he sits down and he reads the newspaper while the helper does all the work. You say, wait a minute, I thought, I thought the plumber would be doing most of the work and the helper would be assisting, like getting certain tools, going to the truck to get certain things that were in the truck coming out, maybe holding things, but you think the plumber would do the major amount of work and the young guy would do the helping. When wives are said to be helpers, it indicates that we bear the responsibility. We should call upon them when we need help, but we should also help the helpers. I'm pretty sure that's how God intended for it. Not that we're the king sitting down, snapping our fingers, and the helper dutifully comes as a servant and takes care of all of our whims. When you're married, you need to be anxious as to how you might please your wife. 1 Corinthians 12, that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same, there's our word, anxiety for one another. I don't know if you came in this morning and you had a chance to look at the bulletin board, but on a yellow sheet there, there is a prayer request, which I suspect you probably know about, but it should cause you and me to be anxious, to be concerned, distracted from our own routines and concerned about our sister Sandy Crutchfield and her unsaved husband, Dale. Medical update there, in case you haven't read it, you might want to in between the services. How can we, how can we take care of this distraction from our own personal things? Here's a sister who's hurting physically herself in great emotional duress because of her husband's condition. How can we be a witness to Dale as we serve our sister? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> Paul says, apart from such external things, which he just listed, there is the daily pressure upon me of anxiety for all the churches. Paul's traveling about. He's setting up new churches. He's revisiting churches that were already previously established. And every time he's at this church, he's thinking about all the other churches he's aware of. That's the concern on his mind. As he's facing a new set of faces, he's thinking about the ones he's previously dealt with. Why? Philippians 2. <clears throat> Paul writes to the church at Philippi. He says, but I hope to send Timothy to you shortly. Then he goes on to say, for I have, <clears throat> now notice this. Paul says, I have no one else of kindred spirit. <clears throat> I have no one else who has the same mindset, the same desires, same priorities that I have. I have no one else that has a kindred spirit like mine except Timothy. Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned, genuinely anxious for your welfare. You know what stands out when I read that? Paul says, I have no one else like Timothy. He's the only one of all my helpers that will be genuinely concerned for you. All the other helpers, you mean like Silas and Barnabas, Titus, Tychius, Aristocharchus, Epaphras, Gaius, Jason, Sopater, John Mark, Luke, the beloved physician, so Thinus, Trophimus, all these guys who are or have been traveling with Paul, there's no one who will be genuinely concerned for you. The only one is Timothy, and I'm sending him. I know you read the account in uh, Acts, and you see the life of Paul traveling with these different companions, not all of them all the time. They join him for the first or first and second or second and third trip that he makes, but 
But, but there's a gaggle of guys accompanying Paul. We say, what mighty spiritual giants they must be. Maybe they're not quite as spiritually minded as we might have thought. I have no one else of kindred spirit who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare except Timothy. Well, let's get back to our text. The concerns of anxiety that Jesus mentions here. Let me reread verses 25 and 31. Verse 25. For this reason I say to you, stop being anxious for your life. Ah, the one who reads people's minds stands before a multitude of his followers. They call themselves disciples. And he knows what's in their mind. Stop being anxious for your life. What are we talking about? Well, he specifies it. What you shall eat or what you shall drink nor for your body as to what you shall put on. I'll drop down to verse 31. Do not be anxious then saying, well, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? And those are the three things that they were concerned about that Jesus mentions. Food, drink, and clothing. Aha! Uh -huh. We could then deduce those are the only three topics that are off limits. Don't be worried and stressed about food, drink, and clothing, but you can be about other things. Yes, you could be worried about your job, you could be worried about your grandchildren, you could be worried about your health, right? Because Jesus only specified those three things. So it's fair game for any other topic or issue. Except we read two verses there in the box, Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing. Peter writes, by the Holy Spirit, casting all your anxiety upon him. <clears throat> now that wonderful little verse in 1 Peter 5, 7 is difficult to apply because when you find yourself churning on the inside, worried and fretting and stewing, it's difficult, isn't it, to come and to throw it, throw it. Not gently place it, it's the word throw. Throw your anxiety upon Jesus Christ. Not my problem. The Lord said he has everything in control. I just need to take him at his word. Okay, so it's anxiety is more than just food, drink, and clothing. It's everything. Here's the cause of anxiety. Jesus says in verse 30, <clears throat> But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you? Here's the issue. This is the cause of anxiety. O men of little faith. He didn't say they were men of no faith. He didn't say they were unbelievers. This multitude that stands before him, multitudes plural, comprised primarily or maybe exclusively of his followers. He says, your problem is you have little faith. Hey, this idea of having <clears throat> little faith shows up again. Look there in your notes, Matthew chapter 8. Jesus said to the apostles, the apostles, why are you timid, you men of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. The apostles, four of which we know at least were professional fishermen that had been out on the sea on small fishing boats like this, who no doubt had been storm tossed <clears throat> previously in their experience as fishermen, were well, they're afraid. And Jesus chides them for being men of little faith. The apostles. The foundation of the church, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Yep, <clears throat> they had little faith. Next reference is Matthew 14. 
And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of Peter and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The first time, first reference we looked at in Matthew 8 is because they were timid. Now the issue is doubting, and it's Peter. Boy, you know, if you're a Roman Catholic, there's so many of these little things that show up in the Gospels that would make you a little reluctant to uh, put your trust in Peter as being the first pope. He was a man of weakness. Matthew 16. <clears throat> but Jesus, aware of this, said, You men... And he's looking into the face of the apostles once again for the third time. You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? And they were confused. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And they thought, leaven, leaven, bread, must be, he's talking about bread. No, they were pretty dull of thinking. So, Sermon on the Mount, the whole mass of people, little faith. The apostles on three different occasions said to be men of little faith. Can you, from your extensive Bible knowledge, recall off the top of your head the two times when Jesus Christ commended individuals for having great faith? Do you remember who they were, those individuals? There was a Canaanite woman who came to Jesus Christ on behalf of her daughter. And Jesus straight-armed her. He said, it's not good to give bread to the dogs. And she should have been humiliated. She should have been downcast. Jesus was saying to her, I've been called only to Jewish people. You are a Gentile. But she's not about to give up. She said, that's right. I am a dog. That, that's how the Jews refer to us Gentiles. We're dogs. We're considered low lowlifes. But even dogs get a little crumb that falls from the master's table. That's all they want. Just one little miracle for my daughter. And Jesus, who had been playing her deliberately, who knew the response, drew out her faith, and he commends her publicly. He says, your faith is great. Be it done to you as you wish. Now, do you remember the second illustration when Jesus Christ commended someone for their great faith. It was a Roman centurion. Jesus said, I'll go to your house. He said, no, no, you don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy to have you in my house. I'm a man who has authority. I tell a soldier, do this. It's done. All you have to do, Jesus, is speak the word. You don't have to go to my house for the healing. You just speak the word here. You have the authority to do that. And Jesus said, you know, I've never seen such great faith amongst any Jewish people. The two individuals that are commended for great faith are Gentiles. Gentiles, believe it or not. You think it would be Jewish people who had a background in the Old Testament scriptures, who knew the God who resides in heaven, knew of his miraculous powers and centuries gone by, but the apostles, the foundation of the church, chided on three occasions for being men of little faith. Don't you wish there was a faith meter you could just sort of strap on your heart for 24 hours and get a readout spiritually as to how your heart is doing? But there is no such thing. It involves introspection. How much do I trust my Savior? Well, we turn our notes over. <clears throat> We're going to see the cure for anxiety. Oh, well, if you're anxious, you just go to your personal physician. You prescribe pills for you. There's all sorts of pills that could take care of anxiety. They calm you down, slow you down. Your mind will go a lot sluggish. And you won't be worrying and fretting as much if you pop these pills. I don't doubt that it takes care of... Um, the consequence of anxiety it slows the body down, the mind down. But you know what the Christian cure for anxiety is on the top of your notes? The Christian remedy is good theology. And it's right here. 
Jesus gave to us the remedy for anxiety in this portion. Let's go back and once again look at verse 25. For this reason, I say to you, do not be or stop being anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. And here it is, the first part of the cure. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And to summarize it this way is that our existence is more than food and clothing. I was sharing with someone this week that I had an uncle in a little town where I grew up of about 2,500 people, and he had a Subaru dealership. And for years, every month, the Subaru Corporation would put out a list of the uh, dealership that sold the most, that made the most sales. Nationwide, he was either the first or second every single month for years in a tiny little town of 2,500. Lois and I used to laugh. We would go back to my home there, and as we were in this county especially, but the town itself, just about everybody was driving Subarus. My uncle was a multimillionaire from a Subaru dealership. He had his own airport with hangars and his own personal uh, runway. And he had a whole series of planes, which at the end of the day, he would invite his uh, friends, a couple, maybe a couple couples and his wife, and they would get in the airplane and they would fly 100 miles to Pittsburgh and go to a fancy restaurant. He would pick up the tab. It was nothing for him to lay down $1,000 for a meal for himself and his friends at a five-star restaurant and then get in his airplane and fly back to little rinky-dink Kerwinsville, Pennsylvania. He ate well over the years. He died of clogged arteries, as you would expect, at a relatively young age. But you and I shouldn't be worrying about fancy meals or will there be enough they're predicting this year, this year that started today, is going to be a down year financially, stock markets. Oh, it's going to be a rough year to hang on. Hang on, folks. It's going to be a roller coaster drop. Don't worry about it. Luke 12, the uh, Sermon on the Plain. Jesus said, beware and be on your guard against lions. No. Snakes, no. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. Well, apparently greed comes in different forms, different manifestations. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of possessions. Honestly, don't you feel badly? I do. I, I suppose you and I share the same perspective in life. Standing in line at the checkout <coughs> counter at the supermarket, I always feel badly because right there as you're waiting for the person up ahead to, to be checked out, they have these crazy magazines, Inquiry, you know, Star Magazine. I always look at it. I don't open them up and look at them. I always look at the headlines. Rich people, movie stars, millionaire athletes, their lives are a mess, but they have the best that the world can offer. They have the wherewithal, millions of dollars to spend on the fancy luxuries of life, and their life is a shambles. Our existence is more than fancy food and most expensive clothing, latest styles. Verses 26 and then 28 through 30. Let's read those. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than those birds? Verse 28. And why you, are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say that Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God arrays the grass... The grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow wilted and dried up and thrown into the furnace. 
will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Here's the summation of those verses. The insignificant creatures, whether it's birds or flowers, the insignificant creatures are amply provided by your heavenly Father. How much more, much more, he says, you are worth much more than those things. How much more will your heavenly Father take care of his children? God's reputation is at stake. There's the uh, corresponding reference from the Sermon on the Plain, Luke 12. Consider the ravens. Ah, ah, Matthew, he said, the birds. Now he specifies one species, the ravens. What do you know about ravens off the top of your head? Beautiful singers? Not really. They're not songbirds. Thieves. Thieves, they are. Look at this from Jewish perspective. He's talking to a group of Jewish people. What are they thinking about ravens? Unclean. They're unclean birds. I remember Elijah sitting by the little brook. There were birds that brought him food. Remember what species? Ravens. Ravens. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, and they have no storehouses or barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? <clears throat> you may want to have bird feeders outside your windows someplace that you can on occasion glance out and see them feeding from the seeds you put out there on their behalf. God could use you to fulfill the scriptures, but it should also be a reminder to you that if you stop putting out bird seed, they'll find something to eat. God will provide for them. Verse 27 is the third reason of good theology to prevent anxiety. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a cubit to his life span? Oh, this causes confusion. A cubit, you know, is the distance from the bottom of your elbow to the top of your middle finger, approximately 18 inches. Now, some say, Jesus is saying, listen, if you worry, you're not going to add 18 inches to your height. Oh, I wish I had an extra 18 inches. I could be a Webster. <laughs> and I say that out of envy. You know what I mean. But some say, no, he's talking about Cuba, but what he's talking about is lifespan. Lifespan. And what he's saying is this, that worrying cannot change your life your heights or your age, whatever the interpretation is there. Luke 21, be on guard. Oh, that phrase comes up again. Watch out. This will sneak up on you. Be on guard that your hearts may not be weighed down with the worries of life. Worries can't improve your life, your circumstances. It doesn't. It does change the circumstances, though. You worry enough, you'll get severe headaches. Do you know that? You worry enough, you'll have a sour stomach. You worry long enough, you'll get ulcers. You worry enough, you'll be unable to sleep. It'll show on your face and your countenance. You worry enough, you'll get ticks. No, not the insects that embed their snout and suck blood out of you. Ticks, T-I-C, nervous twitches. Eyes will be twitching. Why? Because you're been anxious for an extended period of time. It works its way out in your body. Never for good, though. Never for good. Verse 32. For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. What things? The food, the drink, the clothing. That's the priority in the lives of the unsaved. For your, your, not the, he is your heavenly Father. He knows that you need all these things. And the point here is your Father knows that you need temporal things. Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer 
And here it is, with supplication. Remember this verse? Supplication is when you pray for yourself, your own needs. By prayer, that word means adoration. To adoring God, along with praying for your own needs, with thanksgiving. The supplication should be accompanied by thanksgiving. Lord, this is what I'm asking for, and right now, I want to thank you for it. That's what it means to pray by faith. You say it sounds presumptuous to me. No, that's the way God has determined that this is how you please God in your prayers. Let your request be made known to God when you pray with thanksgiving. Lord, it's been very tight, very tight. I'm not sure I'm going to have money for food this week, not, at least maybe not all the week, but I just thank you. Somehow you'll provide for it. Finally, verse 34. Let me read the verse. Therefore, do not be anxious. Stop being anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And the principle here is don't waste today's energy worrying about tomorrow's imagined problems. Now, come on, all of us would have to admit there have been scads of times where we've worried about something that's probably going to happen, and it didn't, right? We stewed and fretted and worried about it. We consumed hours of our times thinking how we're going to respond if it occurs like this. What will I do if this happens? And it didn't happen. And boy, we wasted an awful lot of mental energy, put a lot of stress on our body's functions because of that anxiety. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It doesn't come before the need. God doesn't give you a big squirt of mercy and grace six days before the need arrives. When the need's there, God's there too to take care of it. Okay, so let's summarize these points. I've got a little chart there. Anxiety is pointless. Because life is more than food and clothing. Second, anxiety is senseless. Because the Lord takes care of the birds. He'll take care of you. You are a much higher priority in God's mind than the birds. Third thing, anxiety is useless. Because worrying cannot change your circumstances. Next is, anxiety is faithless. The Lord promised. He, he promised to clothe you and me. Next, anxiety is mindless. Your Father knows your needs. Finally, anxiety is worthless. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And we finish off our study with this confidence. But seek first his kingdom. Didn't say seek only. It said seek first. That's the priority. Seek first his kingdom and also his righteousness. And if that's the priority, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things, the food, the drink, the clothing, shall be. Didn't say might be, could be, possibly be. It says it shall be added to you. Here's some examples. Solomon asked for wisdom when God gave him a carte blanche. Ask anything you want. And he asked for wisdom. And God said, because you asked for wisdom to be a wise king, to rule the people of God, he says, I will give you the things you didn't ask for, that you could have asked for. I'll give you the wealth. 
2 Samuel chapter 6, Obed-Edom took care of the ark of the covenant that was deposited in his house. He watched over that ark for three months until it was brought out of his house and taken to Jerusalem. And the Lord blessed him because Odom Eden gave priority to that ark in his house. Malachi chapter 3. Jesus, I mean the Lord himself says, bring the whole tithe, not a partial tithe like you've been doing, the whole tithe, 10%. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and test me now in this, in what? In giving me the tithe, you're thinking, but my family probably needs a lot of this. Test me, God says, put me to the test by putting, bringing the whole tithe. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until there is no more need. How many times can you think of in the Old Testament where God said, like in Deuteronomy 6, 16, you shall not test the Lord your God. And the examples there in the Pentateuch where Israel tested God and each time they did, the Lord punished them. Don't you dare test God. Except he gives the invitation. He gives the command. God says, test me in this issue regarding your finances. You do that, I'll open up windows heavens. I'll pour out enough for you. Seek first his kingdom. Next week, I want to talk about the kingdom. Step back and look at that word, not just in the Sermon on the Mount, but Old Testament and New Testament. When it talked about God's kingdom, seek his kingdom. What is that specifically? Do you have any comments as we finish off this study this morning? All right, let's close in prayer. Okay. Oh, yeah. I have a question. For the uh, commendable anxieties, the last one about Timothy, concern for welfare, is that for believers? Like, should we be anxious about other salvation? Well, I don't know if salvation as it is their spiritual welfare. You know, we should be concerned that brother is so-and-so in that church is struggling, and I'm in this church. Can I send a messenger to help this guy? Can I write him a little personal note and have it sent to him, you know? Uh, how can I reach out to these people that are on my heart and mind? All of us as Christians have had this, and you've read accounts of it. The Lord puts someone on your mind out of the blue you hadn't thought about this person in months or years, and all of a sudden you begin thinking about them, and you have this burden for them, and you don't know why. It's all so subjective, you know what I mean? Kind of hard to explain, but it's a repeated experience that we have. And so you pray for them, and maybe you make contact with them and say, hey, listen, uh, good to hear your voice. I haven't, we haven't talked in a long time. You've been on my mind, anything going on in your life, and they tell you that they're in the midst of a terrible crisis in their life, a gut-wrenching trial. And you say, isn't that amazing how the Lord put you on my mind at this precise time? The last three days, ever since I've had this, I've been praying diligently for you all throughout the day, over and over again. So I think that's one of the ways that uh, being concerned having an anxiety for people's welfare. There's an old song, I wouldn't sing it for you because I don't know all the words, but it says, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I always do my part to reach that soul for thee. Yeah, we should be anxious about one another. The danger is that we're just anxious about our biological family or we're just anxious and concerned about those who are our age bracket and whom we chat with, but the people that are younger or older than us, we have just casual interactions with them. We should be concerned about the kids in the back building. Out of sight, out of mind for the last 50 minutes, right? But you should be concerned about their, their needs. 
Well, listen, I'm going to go on to a second study here if I don't close this thing. Let's finish in prayer. Father, thank you that there are concerns of life that should be priorities for us to take our eyes off of ourself and our own plans and to be concerned about others and their relationship to the Savior. Forgive us. Forgive us for those times when we've been stressed and pulled about the temporal things of life. And our imagination has got the better of us as we worried about things that might or could possibly be. Thank you that you've committed your, your namesake, your reputation to meet our needs. And as David had said, he'd not seen the righteous begging for food. Whatever happens economically in our country, thank you that you will provide sufficient for us to have sustenance. We love you for being that knowledgeable father who oversees the welfare of each of his sons and daughters. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm.